Hello and welcome to PS On Air, where writers from Project Syndicate talk to the newspapers that publish them. I'm Anatole Kolecki, a contributor to Project Syndicate myself, and with me today I'd like to welcome Professor Min Sin Pei, the author of a celebrated book on corruption in China called China's Crony Capitalism. From the press we have François Bougon of Le Monde, and Sidin Vadukut of the Indian daily newspaper Mint. Minxin, uh, your book, uh, China's Crony Capitalism, suggests that corruption in China is not just a incidental problem, but is at the very heart of the system. In modern parlance, you're saying really, it's not a bug, it's a feature of Chinese communism. Does that imply that actually corruption is impossible to eradicate in China? Yes. Uh, I just finished a book uh, studying corruption in China. What I found is that the fundamental causes of corruption are rooted in the Chinese political economy in the following way. Officials of the Chinese Communist Party control a lot of state property. And that kind of control enables them to convert their political power into personal material gains. And this is the most important piece of the puzzle. Because even today, after 40 years of economic reform, the Chinese state controls assets worth in excess of 50% of GDP. And that's five trillion. Dollars. Now, if it is so deeply entrenched as part of the system, does that mean that effectively everybody involved in the Chinese Communist Party is in some sense corrupt? Uh, is there anybody, is it possible for anybody to be clean, completely clean in the system? Well, I'm not saying everybody uh, that uh, is some official in the Chinese Communist Party is corrupt, but there is a, a joke in China which I might want to share with you, that is, uh, the joke says, if you kill every Chinese Communist Party official, then you will kill some innocent people. But if you kill one, every other official, then there will be a lot of officials who are guilty that are spared. <laughs> yes, so yeah. so that, that gives you yeah. a rough pr approximation. But in that environment, it is difficult to stay clean because there's a dynamic of bad money driving out good money. Uh, well, does that imply that uh, Xi's so-called anti-corruption drive is either doomed to failure, that it can't succeed, or maybe it's not really even serious? Uh, so maybe uh, I'll, I'll put that as two questions. First of all, do you think the top of the Communist Party leadership really is trying to eradicate corruption, or is it more a political purge? And secondly, if they are trying to do it, is it possible? I think it's both, but most of it is political purge. Uh, the party or the top leadership does want to bring back a certain degree of discipline to the party, but it also wants to use this movement to get rid of their political rivals. So that's a combination of both. Uh, whether it's 50-50, 70-60, 70-30, uh, I don't know. But if I have to uh, apportion uh, their focus, I would say 60 about politics, 40% 40 about, uh, 40 about corruption. So it's scratching the surface. It does not deal, the, move, the campaign does not deal with the fundamental causes of corruption. So what does this, Francois, imply for the future of the Communist Party? Do you think? So we, we will have at the end of the year the 19th Congress. Yes. Uh, so it's quite a big and important uh, meeting for the Communist Party. Do you think Xi Jinping will use his anti-corruption drive to, to get all the power? Oh yes, I think he's already accomplished a great deal with his anti-corruption campaign. So the 19th Party Congress will be a turning point in his political agenda. That is, he will use the power he has accumulated through the anti-corruption campaign by giving himself complete and unchallenged supremacy at the top. And then he will shift gear. So if I have to bet the anti-corruption campaign ends with the 19th Party Congress. 
So do you think we will see like a kind of Putinization of, of Xi Jinping, of Xi Jinping willing to go beyond the five years mandate? There are certainly risks or indications now uh, because uh, Mr. Xi is supposed to serve two five-year terms. And the Communist Party normally would appoint a successor this year, five years before that successor takes over. And right now, we don't see any potential successor. So uh, the chances are very good that at the next party congress, Mr. Xi will not have a successor waiting. Uh, and that will serve his purpose very well. But I, I was thinking, just stepping back a little bit, from China alone, taking a broader canvas. It seems increasingly difficult for corporates to succeed, even exist, without kind of interacting with the government in different ways. If you look at the US, which seems to sound more and more protectionist, uh, lots of governments, I mean, that seems to be the platform on which a lot of these new governments seem to be coming. Uh, there are areas like the internet and communication in which you still need regulation. I, st I think it's going to become increasingly difficult for, for crony capitalism to go away, in some sense, there is no incentive for companies to say, look, we don't want to get involved in this. Oh, yeah. I think uh, just based on uh, my own observation, uh, I'm quite familiar with the Chinese case. and also live in the U.S., so I'm familiar with the U.S. situation as well. Uh, ultimately, money is weaker than political power. And uh, those who used to think otherwise because they have not been, their assumptions have not been tested. What we're seeing throughout the world is that in most societies, even in advanced capitalist democratic societies, uh, once political power is used for certain purposes, capital is actually very weak. So in the US today, uh, how many uh, corporations actually can stand up and say no to Trump? Not that many. Well, that, but does that raise the question of whether this crony capitalism, as you put it, is unsustainable? You know, the term crony capitalism in the Asian crisis became almost synonymous with societies that are on the point of collapse, like Indonesia yeah, yeah. did. But it could be that actually this is a crony capitalism that is here to stay. Uh, people have been predicting the collapse of the Chinese Communist Party or, or at least of, of, or, or even the whole of China for decades. It hasn't happened. What's your view on that? Well, uh, the collapse of a regime of a very corrupt system usually uh, occurs in two stages. A very long period of decay, it can go on for decades. Mm -hmm. But then a very quick breakdown. Mm -hmm. So all of us can see the process of decay, but the breakdown, nobody can predict. Mm -hmm. So it can, uh, uh, the Soviet Union, for example, mm -hmm. it was decaying for at least two decades before yes. Gorbachev came along, and then it took three years yeah. for the whole system to unravel. Yeah. So uh, uh, pessimists are always right about the trend. Mm -hmm. They are wrong about timing, mm -hmm. but then nobody is wrong about, uh, nobody can be correct about timing. Mm. Do, do you think there are still reformists inside the party? I think so, they, but you cannot tell from the outside. Mm -hmm. Because in a system such as China's, if you are labeled a reformer, then you have this big bullseye painted on your chest. Mm -hmm. So you are a risk, a threat. Because there's still people <laughs> thinking that Xi Jinping is a reformer, for example. I think on that issue, uh, the consensus is that we've seen what he has done, and what he has done shows that he's not a reformer. You said before, which I thought was really interesting, you said there's a slow burn down in, in corrupt economies and there's sudden yes. crash. Uh, is anybody in China worried about that point? Mm -hmm. There are very sensible people who worry about that point, but most of them, are f like ordinary people, are focused on day-to-day -day issues. So they worry about tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, but not 10 years from now. So there's no fear in China, as much as there is fear outside. Other people worry about China oh, more than China worries about Sensible the people, as I said, worry. That's why there's capital flight out of China. Uh, smart people, smart money, always leave first. Yeah, so more than corruptions, protectionism could be the main danger for, the, for China. Yes, it could be 
the last straw. Because right now everything is in very fragile balance. But then you have a shock to the system. Trump. Trump is a shock to the global system. And now China is part of that system. And we do not know whether the shock can bring down the whole edifice. That's very interesting. So it's an equilibrium, a very unstable equilibrium, yes. and therefore one that could easily be thrown out by a relatively small shock. Oh, yes. It was quite uh, interesting by, uh, you know, the, the, the speech of Xi Jinping in Davos. Yes, uh, yes. He took like the mantle of uh, globalization. Yes. Uh, it's quite uh, for me like uh, a world upside down. Yes. Uh, uh, if you see also the, um, the fact that China leads right now the climate change uh, uh, fight, for example. Uh, so what, what can we think about that? Do you think it's a really, ch it's, a, it's a change, really change, or just a show, just a propaganda uh, show? Yeah, I think overall it's a show because it's a PR offensive. The timing is perfect. Whether China can translate its pro-globalization or global responsibility rhetoric into action depends on different areas. I, I have greater confidence in China playing a much more positive leadership role in the area of climate change because it coincides with China's own national interests. In the area of uh, defending human dignity, defending justice, China's interests are totally antithetical to the prevailing values of the Western liberal world. So there you can see China playing actually a negative role. Oh, yes. What about the more very obvious and direct conflicts that seem to be emerging now over trade with the US yes. uh, under Trump and over the South China Sea? I mean, it seems over the last few weeks yes. as if China and America are really moving into a confrontational mode. What's your assessment of that? Uh, I think uh, Trump's foreign policy and trade policy uh, have sounded huge alarms for China. Uh, on the trade front, we don't know uh, what's going to happen, but clearly China is one of Trump's uh, prime targets. Uh, and uh, it depends, it really depends on what measures Trump takes. So if uh, Trump chooses to impose across the board tariffs on China, then you can expect serious disruption in bilateral commercial relationship. On the South China Sea, uh, the danger is that the U.S. might intensify or escalate its so-called freedom of navigation operations and send them into the 12-mile uh, zone of those artificial islands. Uh, under the Obama administration, the U.S. Navy stayed out of mm -hmm. those areas. Uh, Trump might choose to send those ships sent American warships into those areas, and that could cause a direct conflict. What do you think would be China's response? Well, it depends on uh, what kind of ships are sending and whether China will block American warships with civilian ships. Uh, uh, it's possible, uh, or with armed warships. So uh, there are s several scenarios. Uh, I guess China will uh, be relatively, initially at least, uh, cautious. Uh, it will push back, but it will not push back in such a way as to cause a direct military conflict. And uh, in the same vein, uh, the Pentagon, uh, because the new defense secretary is a very serious person, he may uh, decide to send in not a destroyer, but a naval uh, surveillance ship, unarmed. So that will reduce the probability of conflict. So what kind of China-US relationship can we see under the Trump's administration? What, what, what can we feel right now? Well, the upside is very limited. The downside is huge. Uh, and everything depends on what Trump thinks, what Trump does. Uh, I think China is in a passive, in, in, is on the receiving end. Mm -hmm. uh, China can only respond to what Trump does. So uh, again, uh, when it comes to the new administration in DC, uh, the only thing we know is that we don't know anything.
Now, if, if globalization, which seems to be right now China's strongest kind of weapon to project as a, as a world power, is yes. diminishes, how, what, what platform will China take to project power? I mean, a military platform, an energy segment, what, what will it be? Uh, I think China will uh, pick where it wants to uh, uh, assert its leadership or project its power. Uh, China will always uh, look at the different platforms. The most uh, advantageous platform for China is obviously trade, mm -hmm. because China is the world's second largest trading power, so it can. But the, even on that platform, China's capacity is limited, because China does not have a consumer-based economy. So it's the size, the demand of uh, China uh, is half of the US. Uh, less than half of the U.S. So that, uh, in that sense, it cannot replace the U.S. And I think another one is the regional platform. Uh, the U.S. withdrawal from the TPP really leaves China this open field in East Asia. So it all depends on how China takes advantage of this strategic opportunity. Do you think China is just seeking a regional influence or rather a global influence like United States do before? Yeah. I think China uh, aspires right now, in a very realistic way, uh, regional influence and regional hegemony, because China sees itself as the legitimate East Asian hegemon. It was in that position for hundreds of years, uh, and it has the ability to do so. Uh, Global-wise, China uh, picks where it wants to project its power very, very carefully, because it has very limited resources. It does not have the whole infrastructure to project uh, its influence globally. Most importantly, China does not have allies around the world. But this links to uh, a very interesting article we had on Project Syndicate, I think about a month ago uh, by Professor Chalebi called uh, China's Debt Trap Diplomacy, in which he was arguing that China is now extending its global influence very, very aggressively, but in a different, in a non-military way, through the construction projects, through the One Belt, One uh, Road projects, and the lending that it does to these uh, impoverished countries, which are desperate for infrastructure, the prime example being Sri Lanka, yeah. They then get deeply into debt to China, yeah. and that gives them a lock over these nations, their politics, their finances for decades ahead. What, what, yeah. what do you think of that yeah, argument? Uh, uh, I have not read the article, but I think the argument is totally wrong. Wrong. That is, uh, China, uh, the country uh, that will ultimately bear the burden of this overextension will be China itself. Because if you land to poor countries that cannot repay, mm -hmm you're going to lose. Uh, you all know what a banker says. If uh, I owe you uh, $1, you owe me. If I owe you a $1 million, I owe you. Well, so, you, you, yeah. you may lose financially, but you may gain militarily and geopolitically if you effectively get control or much more influence over these countries' political systems. Is that at least part of the thinking? Uh, yeah. Well, so far, history does not give you examples of uh, credit countries taking over impoverished, impoverished uh, debt countries militarily or politically. Uh, if anything, uh, the outcome is always adverse to the creditors because debt countries can uh, default, uh, can uh, use public opinion to resist uh, the political security demands of credit countries. So I, I'm not going to lose sleep over those, uh, uh, over this kind of issue. Speaking from a strictly Indian perspective, uh, China is seen as uh, the great arch nemesis of the Indian Republic. Everyone in India is obsessed with what China is going to do. Yes. Does China care at all that much? About India? Yes. Not much. It, it's so strange. The, uh, uh, the relationship is very asymmetrical. Mm. For, uh, and in a way, it's uh, uh, what happens to the Indian-Chinese relationship is a mirror reflection image of the U.S.-China relationship. 
in China, everybody cares so much about the U.S. In the U.S., very few ordinary <laughs> people care about China. They yeah. know much about China. So it's, it's, it's the same. It really shows that uh, uh, how important China is to India and how important the U.S. is to China. Uh, I think uh, if the Indian public thinks that China has this uh, grand scheme of trying to contain India, try to uh, prevent India from becoming a great power. I'm sure this uh, this is the mindset in some circles uh, in China. But China is preoccupied mm. with a much more serious external adversary, and that is the U.S., especially under Trump. Now, one view I've heard uh, some years ago at a conference in India, which I thought was really interesting, was they said India is important to China in terms of China's relationship with its own people, and China is important to India in terms of India's relation with its own people. And to kind of clarify yeah. that, China's great fear is that India will achieve China's success staying a democracy. Well, India's great fear is that China will transition into a democracy but still maintain this economic growth. Okay. Thus making it more difficult to justify to its own people why we have the political system we have. Yes. What, what do you think about that? Uh, well, I think the f in terms of China's fear that India will achieve, uh, uh, economic, superior economic growth on the democratic system. Uh, this is uh, this kind of fear is limited to a very small number of people. Uh, the prevalent sentiment about India in China is one of condescending attitude. Is one of uh, uh, complacency. Mm. That look at India because a lot of them have. Officials have been to India. Uh, the first thing they look is India's infrastructure. Nowhere uh, can India compete with China. So right now, uh, that fear may exist, but it's not real. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all we have time for, Professor Pei. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and thank you for watching PS On Air.